welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. So let's just dive straight into the um, Q&A. On Pigeonhole right now, we have a lot of votes with this first question. Are you worried of inflation and the impact on interest rates? We are of the view that inflation is transitory. Uh, the structural headwinds are there if you look at Japan as the forerunner. Uh, the impact on interest rates, so if inflation does uh, kind of rear its ugly head, uh, interest rates would definitely have to respond, right? The Fed would respond. And most of the time, uh, what would happen is that uh, uh, assets of long duration, i.e. Uh, growth stocks, will get hit more because growth stocks are trading on what you call future cash flows. So if you discount that with a high interest rate, you know, you get a much lower present value or and that's why uh, shares of uh, technology companies that are not making money uh, would be doing poorly in that kind of environment. But really, our stance is really to buy into uh, technology companies that are really making lots and lots of money. I mean, the likes of the, you know, the FANG stocks, you know, the NVIDIAs and uh, the Amazon, the Alphabets and, you know, Microsofts and all that. So we think, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the stance that we have taken, we should be quite shielded if our estimation of inflation is wrong. Okay. Um, well, we have a lot on this one, so let's um, go to this question here. It says, is the current China tech stock pullback a buying opportunity? Uh, yes, we like China tech as a whole because in North Asia, including China and the surrounding countries, the tech supply chain plays a very important role in the bigger scheme of the global tech direction. So for the case of China, we can see that they are moving up the supply chain, building a strong ecosystem around it, and it is also creating their own branding and expanding their own technology. So obviously, uh, China and surrounding countries, North Asia, they have their own technological platform. And then importantly is they're also upping the patents portfolio. So all these are pointing towards that. In fact, the tech sector is broadening. Um, we are seeing uh, emergence of new technology platforms and also some of the new branding. So China is definitely in a sweet spot in this because not only they are a major exporter in many things, they also have a strong and rising domestic uh, demand on tech-related uh, components. Okay, this question is very interesting here. It says, where does cryptocurrencies fit in this barbell strategy? You know, you keep talking about barbell. Daryl, you just gave us you know, a very interesting um, talk here on cryptocurrencies. Why don't I let the two of you answer this question? So where does cryptocurrencies fit in this barbell strategy? Yeah, so I think if you notice in the barbell strategy, um, we this is a core portfolio that we advocate for investors to stay long-term investments in. Um, so for us, as cryptocurrencies, we do say that um, we invest only a sum of money that we're comfortable tolerating a high volatility. That's it. Um, Bitcoin has been described as digital gold. And if you look at the barbell strategy, there is a portion of risk diversification that we have with gold. So I do believe that if you, be, if you think the, the pros such as limited supply uh, and, and the fact that it has to be mined, um, these are kind of commodity-like characteristics of Bitcoin. Um, they can also serve a little bit of a diversification for the portfolio. But I would say you do not uh, go in with a size that you're not comfortable with because as we can all see, the volatility is quite... Uh, it's quite high. So when, I, you, yeah. when you say the size that you're not comfortable in, give us a sense. You know what is the percentage that we're looking at? So with there has been some studies that, that we've done, and we think that even a really small percentage of a portfolio, say five percent, um, actually augments the risk return profile quite significantly. Of course, we will take that with a pinch of salt because, as we know, Bitcoin is still a relatively newer asset compared to fixed income and equities, but with the last 10 years of track record as we have had in Bitcoin, uh, even a 5% allocation does actually augment the risk return profile of your portfolio. Okay, so let's look at this other question here. It says, so will we see another 10 to 30% global stock market correction in the future? Because the market has been going up drastically to new mm. record highs. So should we be worried as investors? Yeah, so, you know, this question has been surfaced uh, in the last three to four years. Yes. And uh, you know, every, every time there is this lingering fear, you know, the market is going up, we are in the midst of a pandemic, why is it not you know, topping out and coming down? So for the reasons that I've said just now, that there's just so much of liquidity out there. 
And more than that, actually, if you look at you know, the companies that we participate in, they are really making a lot of money. The beautiful thing about you know, these platform, e-commerce platform, cloud companies is that they continue to show lots of earnings momentum. In fact, the visibility is very high for double-digit earnings growth over the next several years. So I think, uh, you know, they should hold on, you know, to their gains, even if there is some kind of a short-term exogenous event. Uh, but uh, without that exogenous event, I, I don't see why the market should correct to the extent of a 30%. Maybe, you know, a, a kind of a shallow 10% is, is possible, you know, in, in, in the light that it has gone up so much, yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's look at this question here because we have a lot of votes on it as well. Um, and we all like REITs. So what is your recommendation on Singapore REITs? Which segments of REITs do you like? Okay, Sing REITs fits well in the income side of Barbara's strategy. And it is one of our conviction on the long-term call holding because it delivers uh, earning certainty or dividend certainty. As we know, Sing REITs will deliver at least 90% of the profit before tax, okay? So we like Sing REIT because beside this earning certainty, it is also very transparent in the dividend distribution, and people can see the physical building. When you come to Singapore, when you go around, you go to shopping, you see all this. Uh, for Sing Read, our preference would include this um, data center related read, because Singapore increasingly is becoming a data center uh, preference allocation. Then we also like industrial read because of the ability to transform some of its capacity or asset into data center related kind of businesses. Then we also like uh, logistic read. As we know, Singapore has become a main logistic hub in ASEAN, connecting different parts of the world. Mm. So these are some of the Singapore REITs that will benefit massively in this long-term secular trend with some sort of growth potential on a long-term marginal or consistent growth potential long-term basis while delivering consistent dividend yield. Okay, so let's go um, on the other side then, um, which is what do you think of Chinese um, electric vehicle stocks such as NIO, XPEV, Li, Auto, etc. versus Tesla? Well, we know um, Tesla has a plant in Shanghai, so they have production. Um, China is the world's largest car market. And interestingly, last year, total car sales in China in 2020 was higher than the year before. Something like that, all right? So definitely the government policy is very pro-EV. Uh, pro okay? So the demand domestically for EV will be there. And we believe that this long-term trend will benefit a big group of companies involved in either making EV or supplying the components to EV. So while EV company or EV brands are still remain quite new in this world, but we also see that the investing potential will also come along the components, the semiconductor chipset supplier, power management IC that comes with the whole electrification platform in the EV universe. Yeah, so it goes very nicely with Weifu. You've always been you know, advocating the barbell and the idea as well, right? The innovation and also the enablers yeah. to, to this. Um, so, okay, Daryl, this is, a, I'm sure, to target it for you. Any investment opportunity of crypto coin through DBS, funds or direct purchase? I, th I think, it's, as we all know, we have an exchange that, that, that we, that's up and running, and, and definitely we can uh, purchase cryptocurrency through there. Um, but I, I guess the key question here is whether you want to do it to, to in, in other forms, whether you want to do it with funds or with a direct exposure. Um, I would say that if you have the time to invest into learning about the protocols of the individual cryptocurrencies, because they are not all the same, right? If you have the time to do that research, perhaps you have the key knowledge you need to actually buy the individual cryptocurrencies. But of course, if on the other hand, um, you do not have the time to invest, I would say go with funds. If you want to gain, gain exposure to a new technology, uh, it's in its nascent stages, uh, having a fund manager who knows the market would be able to gain you exposure while over, hopefully managing the downside for you. So I think that's how we should segregate our thinking. Okay, well, you know, keep those questions coming in as well. Don't forget, you know, you can also vote for them because I'm looking at the questions that I have before me and getting a lot of votes on China. So I think, um, you know, Chingling, this is another one for you. Are dividend from China banks sustainable? Yes, uh, we like China banks. Again, it fits well in the income side of Barbara. It's also one of our conviction idea. Um, China banks deliver very attractive dividend yield at the rate between the range of 5 to 7% depending on the cycle. So we believe that the dividend yield is sustainable. They have been sustainable and likely to stay, show, uh, stay so. For example, last year was a COVID year. And China banks, the large state-owned banks that we like, not only they did not 
reduce the absolute dividend payout, but rather the dividend payout, some of them were even slightly higher. So it shows that the ability to pay. And in terms of sustainability, China banks tend to pay out 30% of the net profit. So they don't pay out a lot, 30%. That is why we strongly believe and we always believe that the sustainability of dividend paid out, dividend yield among the China large bank is there. Okay. So I hope that answered the question. You know, we, we still have time. The next question is this. The Hong Kong markets has been lagging the US by quite a wide margin. Do you see this persisting? Yeah, uh, Chingling can chime in here as well. But uh, really, this uh, past, I would say, five to eight years, <laughs> it's the US market that is you know, outperforming every other market in the world, right? Uh, why? Because if you think about it, you know, the world is changing. And the biggest uh, change is that the world economy is turning into a digital economy. And which is why we, we, we came up with this acronym, IDEA. You want to buy into such companies uh, that can uh, thrive in a digital economy. So the innovators, you know, Apple, like I said just now, was a great, is a great example. They launched the first smartphone called the iPhone in 2007. And all our lives have changed. Everyone is fixated on the smartphone, you know. And uh, in, that process, in that period of 13 years, the price of Apple has gone up 30x. Similarly, the likes of Amazon, you know, the disruptors, the enablers, semiconductors, uh, and adapters. So where do these companies, where are they located in? Most of the time, they are in the US. In some areas, China. But that's where the... The, 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 you know, the, the play is, you know, and will be for, for a considerable period of time as we become more digital. So, uh, Hong Kong, uh, ASEAN, they are cheap and possibly, you know, they, they, they look good value today, but we have to wait for a catalyst to see, you know, something to create that price appreciation. Uh, uh, we have yet to see that. But as it stands today, I think it's, it's reasonably attractive. Ching Ling, you want to chime on it? Yes. See, when we first started investing many years ago, Hong Kong market was full of property-related names. And it has remained largely so over the past almost 30 years. And Hong Kong has really missed out in terms of the technology supply chain, be it on the application side or the hardware side or component side. So in this sense, when the world was moving towards digitalization and more devices were being rolled out, the supply chain did not or was not located in Hong Kong. So that has affected. Then recently, due to some of the pandemic, it has also affected the physical spending pattern of the consumer, mm. So, which has also affected some of the shopping mall related uh, uh, kind of capacity and, and storefront activities. So this has also, in a way, uh, affected a lot of, not just Hong Kong, but a lot of uh, other, other countries where, or other regions where they do not have a semiconductor or technology supply chain. But nonetheless, Hong Kong remains to be an important uh, investing location because they have certain stocks which come with very good uh, branding, uh, good asset quality, and long track record. So when the economic cycle returns in a favorable way, we believe that the Hong Kong stock market, the Hong Kong sector, will be able to capture this bandwagon and to go for the re-rating. Right, so I hope that answered um, the question because that had a lot of votes. Daryl, this one I think is for you as well. The, the question here is, you talked a lot about Bitcoin. Are the characteristics of the other cryptocurrencies the same though? So, I think this question is tricky because there are more than 5,000 cryptocurrencies out there. Yeah, exactly, but there are, <laughs> so, those, there, there are a couple of names that just keep being bantered around, right? Yeah, there are. There are. So, so, I mean, um, just because it's an open source system, it's very easy to copy the source code and then replicate your own cryptocurrency. And I think that's what a lot of uh, people are doing out there. But if you were to just compare maybe the two biggest, which is between Bitcoin and Ethereum, I think I've, I've spoken out about Bitcoin. Yep. So the differences uh, with Ethereum is that you have the ability to actually uh, put on some, some, of, some form of programming source code onto the blockchain. And this allows for programmers to code applications and programs and smart contracts. And, and these, these are applications that have led to what you see today in decentralized finance and also NFTs, which are called non-fungible tokens. So uh, Ethereum, I would say, if I were to compare a main difference between the two, I would say Bitcoin is an, a developing alternative scarce asset, whereas Ethereum is a developing alternative means of transaction with real-world applications through 
uh, new developments. So I think uh, that it's worth doing a lot of work in this because it is a new phase, it's a new area, and, and I'm sure there are a lot of cryptocurrencies coming up that would do more than what I've just mentioned. So I think they are not the same. In, in summary, they're not the same. It is worth doing a bit of research to, to, to learn more about it. All right, okay. So this next question then, um, it goes to, I, I, I guess, you know, to, to everyone here. As global property prices are at a high level, do you think real estate is still a good inflation hedge going forward? Yeah, so in a world where money is printed every day, right? Hard assets is where you want to be. They will do well. You know, the likes of real estate, uh, gold, commodities, uh, they will do well. But again, you know, I've, as I've said to many, many clients, you know, you made so much of your wealth and you have so much of your wealth in property already. So, you know, you, for your tradable liquid assets, uh, buy into something else. You know, buy into the best of class technology companies, the best of class consumer discretionary companies, you know, the likes of the luxury companies in Europe, you know, uh, and, and the best of class banks, for example. So, you know, the liquid, more tradable portfolio, you should have a global kind of uh, uh, opportunity set, you mm. know, in mind. Yeah. Next one, do you still like gold? What's the best way to gain exposure in gold? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah we, we like gold. talking about gold. <laughs> yes, it's a very good risk diversifier. Yeah. So, what's the best way to gain exposure yeah. in gold? Then yeah, I think there are a few good. options. Um, some some investor would prefer to hold some physical gold, as like we mentioned, the mm. supply is limited. Then the other way to have a diversified a multi a security holding will be through gold funds, or gold ETF, because this will give exposure to either physical gold or also companies that are either directly or indirectly involved in the gold mining. Yeah. So so. Uh, uh, another way of expressing that is to buy into gold mining companies. You can do assess that through funds or directly into individual companies as well. Yeah. Okay. Next question I have here. Um, it's with the limited um, quantitative easing QE and the US Treasury Secretary pushing for raising of US government borrowing cap. Please comment on the prospects of um, US dollar and US dollar denominated high yield corporate bonds. Yeah. So I'll take this one. Um, so this, there's a lot of information in this question. And I think uh, the background is, I mean, the US has uh, really just uh, had a lot of spending plans. And, and I think uh, where the question is coming from is how are these spending plans are go going to be enacted and, and without having interest rates rise because there's going to be so much uh, borrowing that's needed to come to the market. Well, the thing about the US is that they have a huge central bank. And and, and they can finance the borrowing just by printing money and purchasing the bonds needed. So in that sense, um, because borrowing is expected to increase, we also do expect the central bank to be proactive in managing the interest rate environment. And I don't think they can allow the interest rate environment to rise too drastically because there is going to be, as this question has said, a huge amount of debt coming in. So when you have a larger debt base coming in, you raise interest rates on that higher debt base is going to lead to a bit of systemic pressure. So I think the central bank will be proactive. They will keep, as we have mentioned in the presentation, rates meaningfully low uh, to make sure that the debt burden doesn't become excessive. And because the interest rate environment is going to be low, we believe, therefore, that taking part in some excess yield in high yield corporate bonds is actually a meaningful strategy, where, just, where because the central banks are proactively keeping interest rate environment low, you need that additional buffer of yield and that's where you can find it in high yield corporate bonds. Okay, well, that, I hope that answered that question. You know, as usual, you know, when we're having a good time, time flies. But before we go, um, I just want you know, each of you to just have some parting words for our viewers. You know, what is their take-home message from you, Wei Folk? Yeah, I think uh, you know, uh, one has to stay invested. You know, if you just hang on to cash, it's not going to pay you a lot. And you have a situation where supply is unlimited, right? Because the central banks uh, keep kind of print money, you know, and kind of stuff. So, so the, the only way you can preserve value in the surpluses that you have is to invest in them, be it in high yield bonds, be it in equities uh, for growth as well as for your dividend stocks. You know. Okay, stay invested. Daryl? I think um, one thing I would like to, to leave with everyone is cash is thrash. And, and I say this because in, if we are expecting an environment of inflation, cash is the 
is the, is the asset that doesn't protect you against it. In fact, inflation is the devaluing of cash against goods and services. So I would say um, you have to meaningfully deploy that cash that you have if, if there's a lot of excess liquidity out there. Um, if you are afraid of inflation and not going into the asset markets, I think that is a little bit reserved. reserved. So I think, I think in line with what we've said, staying invested uh, helps to at least uh, generate a meaningful return that's commensurate with what inflation is going to come. So I, I think that that should be the takeaway. Ling, okay. last but not least. Remember the word barbell. On one hand, it gives income certainty, diversified. On the other hand, it captures the digitalization secular trend. And then with the goal as a risk diversifier. So literally, it gives the best of both worlds for investors to stay invested and capture the long-term secular trend. Thank you so much for that insight. You know, as usual, time flies. Um, but I think my takeaway from this, which I found very interesting so far, is, you know, as you mentioned uh, there, you know, you say that there are opportunities in secular trends. We have to see it because the world is transitioning into a digital economy. And that cryptocurrency is too big to ignore. We have to take notice of it as well. And Let's not forget our traditional, which is gold as well. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your insights today. And on behalf of DBS Bank, thank you again for joining us this afternoon. And stay safe, everyone.